Good evening. I'm Dr. Andrew Pinkerton, Chairman of the Lancashire Area Panel of the Institute of Mechanical Engineering, and I would like to welcome you to the online lecture titled Bolt Securing and Bolt Tensioning Systems. This talk will provide general information about securing elements, including loading, loosening, and failure, and the factors that affect them. It will also co cover some of the high core tech systems. You will look at the humble nut and bolt in a new way following the talk. If you have any questions, either during or after the talk, please type them in the attendee question box, and as many as possible we'll put to the speaker at the end of the talk. Uh, the talk will be recorded and made available via the iMechE website within seven days, so if you do find it useful, feel free to reference it or advise your colleagues to listen in later. So without further ado, let me introduce the speaker, Tobias Hubing. Tobias is Head of Laboratory and a Certified Fastener Engineer at Heiko Group, based near Dortmund in Germany. He has worked for the group since receiving a Master's Degree in Engineering from the University of Cologne in 2013. And over that time, he's built up the laboratory so it can now offer several test methods for bolted connectors. He also represents the company at expert lectures and on several te technical committees. Uh, I think you'll agree he's well qualified to give the talk, so I'm now going to hand over to him. Uh, take it away, Tobias. Yeah, thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you very much for inviting me to give this webinar. So at first, I want to to introduce uh, the Heiko company. So as Andrew told you, um, we are located uh, with uh, two manufacturing um, locations in Germany, near Dortmund. Besides this, we have uh, 14 subsidiaries um, throughout the world, also in the UK. So um, our products are um, divided into four product lines. We have uh, the historical nail production and uh, also uh, code for forging parts. But uh, today's uh, relevance uh, uh, product lines are the Heiko lock wedge lock systems, which are both uh, securing devices, and the Heiko tech tensioning systems. Yeah, our company exists uh, since uh, yeah, 1900. So we are, the company is uh, over 100 years old. We are in fourth generation family on it, and uh, we have uh, yeah, nearly 430 employees through the world. So we are a medium-sized company. Yeah, we have uh, uh, very uh, much products in our company, which uh, shows our cap capacity of uh, mass production. Um, so um, uh, every day, I believe, uh, over yeah, thousand. Uh, uh, parts or over thousand parts of the company. So this is my, um, yeah, my field or test laboratory for both the joints. So as Andrew told you, we um, offer, um, yeah, different services um, for our customers as well as for research and development and for quality control. So we are able to run uh, vibration, uh, vibration tests with our wedge lock washers. We run torque preload tests to support our customers with uh, talks to assemble our products. Um, we uh, test the quality of our, um, of our products in our laboratory. Um, yeah, the final quality control takes place there. Hello, apologies for this. Um, I think Tobias' sound is lost. Uh, Tobias, can you please make sure your connection is okay again? Thank you. So, hello everybody, I'm back. I, I've read I'm, I'm, the microphone was off. I'm very sorry. We have uh, some disconnections here. So, um, yeah, you've seen the first slide with the presentation um, of our uh, company. Uh, so now I hope uh, the audio works for the final for the final audience for the final webinar. So here are some examples from loose bolts I found into the in the news. So you see that uh, the um, the self bolting is uh, 
uh, actual topic in the both in the in all major industries as well as in the automotive industries or the aerospace industries. So everywhere you look at, there are some problems regarding the loose yeah, loose bolts. So what uh, is a safe bolt? So there's a definition in the VDI 2230 part one, which is a major uh, calculation and dimensioning specification, which is worldwide known. So the bolt, the bolt the joint in VDI uh, 2230 is defined as a bolted joint is a detachable connection between two or more parts by means of one or more bolts. It is intended to transmit forces and moments between the jointed parts in a clearly defined position related to one another. The bolts are to be designed in such a way that they withstand the occurring working loads and the connection thus produced fulfills the function of the joints. So, what does it mean? It does mean that we have to find a preload which is uh, which is able for to um, ensure the functionality of the bolt. So this is the um, golden thread through my um, webinar. It's uh, at first we have to dimension a preload. Then uh, a pre this preload has to be generated. Then uh, the preload has to be yeah retended to by securing devices or something else. And afterwards. Um, the preload, uh, yeah, the bolt has to be designed to be designed to have the ability to withstand the preload as well as the external loads. So we will start with the preload dimensioning. You see in the background, it's uh, the torque, uh, the to uh, distortion triangle, but the basis for dimensioning is the spring model. So. Um, you can uh, yeah, replace yeah, in the theoretical model the bolt is a kind of parts and the bolt and the nuts by two springs which are uh, which are a, a parallel connection. So we have a bolt here is shown as a red spring and the clamped part um, represented by the blue spring. Uh, spring. So it is possible because you know all parts of steel are yeah very stiff strip springs within their mechanical limits. So they are able to um, be compressed or um, elongated, and uh, after the load is uh, reduced, the elongation goes uh, to zero. So on a bolt, that means that uh, when a bolt is preloaded. It's elongated, you see it here, comparing of the unloaded and the preloaded condition. On the bolt, it's acting a preload force, which leads to elongation um, of the bolt, and the bolted parts are compressed, so that the clamp force is acting um, in the interface between the bolted parts. And the clamp force is the main, um, the, or the crucial, force to ensure the functionality of the bolted joint. Yeah, the elongation and the compression of the bolt or the clamped parts can be shown in this distortion triangle or clamping diagram. So um, directly after the assembly, the preload and uh, the clamping force um, have the same height but a different direction but uh, you can show it as a triangle. So the lines here show that the bolt is elongate, elongated a little bit more than the bolt parts are compressed. This is um, yeah, the usual state because the bolt parts um, have a smaller, yeah, we call it in bolt life, we speak about the actual resilience. It's uh, nearly the same than our, uh, the spring stiffness. So you can see the bolt is elongated and the bolted parts are compressed under um, under preload. 
So this is the basis for all dimensioning in VDI 2230, which is a very nice and detailed uh, calculation procedure, which is written um, yeah, by the VDI. So this is a, a German association of engineers. It's uh, written into two languages, which means that you have on the one side the German, on the other side the English language. I uh, think it's also available in Japanese. Um, but it shows a very detailed and very structured calculation of a bolted joint. And uh, within the first calculation steps, um, a preload has to be calculated to, um, to uh, have a specific assembly preload. Here we can see the, the, the calculation steps. Uh, in total, there are 13 steps. Um, Besides the, yeah, the zero steps where you are checking the limits for the VDI 2030 because also the VDI 2030 is not, uh, cannot be uh, applied on every bolt so because they are limiting diameters for the contact surfaces. Uh, but, in, but, but within the first six um, uh, calculation steps, they are um, yeah, summarized in the main dimensioning formula. So this is the area where we dimension the bolt. The end of this dimensioning will be a bolt with a specific nominal diameter and a strength class. And the uh, second one from step 7 to step 12, you have to, yeah, to have to bring the evidence that your bolt is able to withstand the assembly stresses and as well as the working stresses. And finally, if the bolt should be uh, Tightened uh, with an assembly torque, you have also to calculate a torque. Here you see this uh, main dimensioning formula in detail, so it's uh, very detailed, but uh, yeah, it's simply to explain. You want to have a, a clamp force in your, in your uh, bolted joint, and you know that there could be some losses. So um, within the brackets, they see the FK. This is a um, minimum required clamp force, which um, originates from the functionality or the intended use. Then uh, you sum up uh, the loss of preload in your bolted joints, which is, which is caused by the actual load which can act on the bolt, which means that uh, there's a, lift, a kind of lifting in the interface between the bolted parts, which reduce the clamp force between the bolted parts. Then you have loss of preload due to embedding or settlement, um, which is uh, represented by the, um, by the point F with index Z, and you have the loss of preload to terminal change. And so, which this is within the bracket, the minimum preload you need to, um, to ensure so that your bolt the joint is able to fulfill the requirements. And then you have to consider your tightening technique with the tightening factor A. So um, it's a very big formula. The only thing you have to, to know is that uh, there you have a preload you want to ensure, a clamp force you want to ensure in the interface between the bolted parts because the functionality um, is based on this clamp force and then you um, add the expected losses on this clamp force between the bolted parts. And this means that you got your minimum preload you have to ensure. And then you have your tightening technique, which is uh, yeah, um, affected uh, with, uh, by some scatter, scattering, so that you got a final maximum preload, which is uh, crucial for your bolt. So all this, uh, this uh, actions, all these uh, factors or <laughs> these uh, parameters can be, uh, can be are visible in uh, this big uh, distortion triangle. So again, I told you we want to have the, um, the final preload, uh, clamp load, the final clamp load within the bolted parts, which is shown here in red. You see also the red arrow which uh, yeah, makes it very visible. This is the clamp force we need to transfer the loads. Yeah, but the beginning with the blue 
this is blue uh, triangle, you see that there is a loss of preload due to embedding. It's uh, the um, FZ, it's called FZ. So it means that the, you know, the roughness and surface is compressed, and due to this uh, plastic deformation of the surface roughness, we uh, have a specific loss of preload. So this happens directly or very shortly after assembly, and uh, afterwards we are um, at the green triangle. You go from the from the blue triangle after embedding to the green triangle, and now the actual force is acting on the bolted joint, which uh, causes an additional um, preload increase for the bolt, but it also cause cause uh, um, a decrease of the clamp force in the bolted parts. And so finally we have the remaining clamp force, which must be um, higher than the required clamp force. And of course it has to be ensured that the minimum assembly preload is um, generated, generated in the bolted joint. And because uh, every titanity scatters, we um, have a maximum assembly preload, which depends on the scattering of the tightening technique. This is shown with a black triangle. So now we're leaving this topic and go over to the next topic. This is the topic preload generation. So I would stop here a little, a little moment to come back to To, uh, see again, to see again the slides. Okay, so the next, um, the next uh, is the preload generation. So as you appeared in the, um, in the um, chapter before, we want to achieve a specific preload, but uh, direct preload measurement is not possible in many applications. So we have to find some parameters which are related to the preload. This could be the assembly torque, which is very common. This uh, could be as well as the tightening angle. Um, also, you can measure the elongation of the bolt um, or the uh, compression of the bolted parts. Um, all these parameters define different tightening techniques. And the different tightening techniques are um, um, the difference between them is yeah, the scattering of the resultant preload. This is expressed in VDI 2030 by the uh, tightening factor alpha A, which is also called the assembly uncertainty factor. You have seen in the main dimensioning formula that uh, the tightening factor is placed before the bracket, which means that uh, we have to uh, multiplicate and the minimum preload with this factor, which means if the tightening um, technique is, has a higher uncertainty, um, also the, um, the tightening factor becomes bigger. Yeah, scattering of the assembly preload can be caused by errors when estimating the coefficient of friction. This is uh, yeah, very crucial for the um, main dimensioning formula. Um, this is very crucial for the sorry for the um, torque control tightening, then operating and reading errors. This are possible on all tightening techniques. The tightening technique itself um, has some uncertainties, and also in instrumental error, errors are um, um, are represented by the tightening by the tightening factor. Yeah, the, cho the chosen uh, tightening uh, technique has a substantial effect on the result in assembly preload, so there's a big um, optimization, optimization potential um, because uh, yeah, the factor alpha A can go up to four for impact ranges, which uh, cause a very big scattering, so that you have to, yeah, you have to design your bolt or choose your bolt uh, five times bigger as, four times bigger as required. This can lead to a very big nominal diameter. Yeah, on the next slide, uh, it's only um, a short overview about different tightening techniques. Um, 
they can be divided into two main uh, topics. The first one is uh, attractive free, and uh, the first one are the rotatory methods uh, like uh, yeah, torque control tightening and uh, yeah, tightening with impact ranges, as well as uh, yield controlled or angle control tightening. And the second uh, topic is tractive or torsion free tightening. Um, which is uh, done by hydraulic actual tightening tools or can be done with uh, tension nuts. Yeah, I tried to um, to sort it a little bit so you see the tightening practice from the VDI 2230. Um, as uh, more as accurate the tightening method is, as lower is the tightening factor. So you see you control tightening, uh, control tightening has a tightening factor of uh, 1.2 to 1.4, while tightening with impact ranges had the tightening factor up to 4. Yeah, and uh, the torsion-free tightening methods had also very low tightening factors. Yeah, I also write down the efforts. So, of course, it's, uh, yeah, the effort is very low for the torque control and tightening. You need an impact wrench. Um, but when you have uh, larger bolts, you also need uh, yeah, maybe a hydraulic, uh, a hydraulic wrench or something else. Um, then, of course, when there, um, there um, any um, additional measurement uh, devices are required for the angle or maybe for the yield control and tightening, the effort becomes bigger. And uh, for yeah, bigger tools, which uh, maybe uh, can be required for the hydraulic actual tightening, their um, effort becomes can be very high. Yeah. So at first, I want to show you you pre present uh, the preload generation with a torque control tightening. So small bolts, but uh, M24. Yeah, it's not a really small bolt, but uh, this is maybe the limit uh, which is possible to tighten with muscular power which is possible to tighten with a handheld signaling torque wrench. Larger bolts have to be um, yeah, tightened with hydraulic tools because muscular power is not sufficient anymore to, um, to bring the required torque. Yeah, you see it's on a small picture. This is a torsion free tightening method, um, which is very common for larger bolts, but it can also be assembled with a um, hydraulic torque wrench. On the next slide, you see the tightening torque. The total tightening torque you apply to the bolt is divided into two partial torques. Um, the first one is the thread torque, and the second one is the uh, torque at the bearing surface. Um, the tightening torque on the thread is affected by the friction, which is uh, represented by the um, by, by uh, the Kofner friction of the thread. And uh, the, the friction at the bearing surface is uh, yeah, represented by the Kofner friction at the bearing surface. Here, to calculate uh, the required torque, you have to use the maximum uh, assembly preload you have to calculate. You have calculated in the previous chapter or with the main dimension formula. Um, and you use the minimum Kofner friction, the thread, and the bearing surface which means that you you have to ensure that you, on one hand, that you uh, generate a minimum preload to ensure the functionality, and on the other hand, you have to ensure that the preload, that the bolt is not over-tightened. This is the reason why you have to use the minimum coefficient of friction. Yeah, on the next slide, you can see what, uh, yeah, the deviation or the um, the amounts um, of the uh, partial torques. So the thread torque is additionally divided into the thread pitch torque and the thread friction torque. And then you have the, um, the bearing torque, the friction torque and the bearing surface. This is an example. I have uh, calculated it for uh, um, coefficient of friction of the thread and the, at the bearing surface um, with a coefficient of friction of 0 0.14. It could be an example for uncoated yeah, and slightly oiled bolts. 
here you see that uh, we have a very high amount of uh, uh, friction at the bearing surface and uh, also high amount of the friction um, to overcome the strike friction and only 11% of the torque um, are used to preload the boat. Um, nearly 90% are needed to overcome the friction, which means that uh, yeah, a bolt, a uh, torque control Titan bolt has a, yeah, a low efficiency factor when you want to express it in that way. But the main topic or the main question is uh, what is the correct friction in my assembly? Yeah, there are different torque tables available. For example, in the VDI 2230, there are um, yeah, tables um, um, attached uh, where you can choose a torque um, uh, on the basis of uh, the coefficient of friction in the thread and at the bearing surface. But it's not easy to to estimate those coefficient of friction. There are also also tables with uh, with um, yeah, where you can where you can estimate your friction for diff for a specific coating or a specific lubricant, but the problem is that uh, it is not a constant value. It's uh, always uh, some kind of a range or coefficient of friction window. So um, you might be yeah not have your actual friction or the minimum friction, which makes it a little bit difficult. Yeah, for this reason, you can do. Oh, sorry. For this reason, you can do testings. So, as we offer it for our customers, we have a torque preload test rig, two torque preload test rig um, to do torque preload tests from M3 to M30, which means we can uh, support our customers with assembly torques for their boats with our watch lock washers because also our watch lock washers affect the friction in the bolted joint and uh, yeah it has to be a, a new torque has to be uh, defined to generate the same preload here you see a photo of our of our uh, preload test rig in the laboratory and the section of view so we measure the, to the total torque with the torque angle, angle sensor we uh, measure the preload and the thread torque in a um, combined sensor. And when we have the total torque and one partial torque, we can calculate the coefficient of friction of the thread and at the bearing surface with the formula you have seen before. Yeah, we can apply the bolts and uh, we can also um, apply the mating surface, which is, re which is represented in this uh, picture by the test bar we use. Yeah, here are some examples of uh, you see some examples of um, yeah uh, measurement results from our talk preload testings. Um, yeah, uh, uncoated bolt with no lubricant, and uh, it's the same bolt with a little bit of lube oil. You see, there are slightly or there are heavy differences between those those bolts as well as the thin galvanized bolts with no lubricant. So in this case, there. Um, the coefficient of friction are higher than the, for the uncoated bolt, but uh, yeah, they could be even higher if fretting occurs because zinc galvanized bolts tend to fretting um, when they are not lubricated. Yeah, besides the surface, also locking devices affect the, fun uh, the friction. Um, there is the over tightening torque for thread lockers or lock nuts. Um, and there is additional torque at the bearing surface, which has to be overcome by the um, total tightening torque, uh, for example, for wedge lock washers or for um, serrated washers or something else. Because all of them, they have radial teeth on the outside to increase the friction. And uh, so you have to apply a higher torque to generate the same preload. Uh, if possible, in some cases, if possible, you can um, express those um, additional torque by higher coefficient of friction. Here I have an example from our lab testings where we have um, yeah, tested uh, hexagon bolts in uncoated condition and we um, have not lubricated them. 
on a test bar made of stainless steel in also unhardened condition. Um, and you see the difference between the bolt when a high lock is applied or when it's uh, not locked. So um, you see it on the red line, this is the unlocked bolt, and the blue line are the high lock. So the high lock, you can see it on a small picture um, above, it has the serrations on the outside so that we have to increase the torque. So you see with 200 newton meters, uh, it preload was with a high clock of only 60 kilonewton was applied and uh, the, the maximum preload with the uncoated assembly was uh, over 80 kilonewtons. So this means we have to increase the torque of the high clock assembly by approximately 30 to 40 percent to generate the same preload. This is done with our general torque recommendation. We um, which is a support for our customers, where we um, show some examples. For example, when you use an assembly paste, uh, we have here friction in the, in the thread of uh, 0 0.1, and also the cofin of friction at the bearing surface, which is affected by our high locks. And the same is shown in the, yeah, for the, for the uh, yeah, uncoated condition and unlubricated condition. But of course, this is always only a recommendation. Um, in crucial or very critical cases, we offer our laboratory services with a torque tension or torque preload measurement. Yeah, a high accuracy. Hi, Tobias. I think we lost your sound again. Um, apologies again. Hi, everybody. Um, until Tobias comes back, I'll let's uh, remind you that we won't be able to play the videos today uh, with this uh, unfortunate technical issues. So we will try our best to add them to the recording uh, for this event if you want to watch this again and see all these videos. Thank you. Okay, I'm very sorry. So uh, the, um, the, um, I was interrupted again, and I have to dial in again. Um, I hope uh, this uh, has no difficulties. Um, unfortunately, I cannot see um, the video, and uh, but I think you have seen it in the meantime. You have seen uh, how the um, Hycotech tangent nut is assembled, and. Uh, you have seen uh, how it's built up. So the next slide shows the um, shows the advantage of the torsion-free tightening methods um, in comparison to the to the um, to the rotatory tightening methods. And uh, due to the fact that the thread is not rotated. Um, you have no torsional stress in the bolt because uh, during, rotation, during rotation you have this uh, uh, coefficient of friction the thread which uh, causes uh, uh, torsional stress inside the rotatory tightened bolt. For a tractive tightening method it means that you have higher standard tensile stresses in the bolt or high, higher tensile stresses are possible. Usually bolts are Usually, um, um, bolts are tightened uh, with uh, or di dimensioned to uh, have 90% of their yield strength for rotatory tightening, where yeah, you can up in most cases 10% uh, is for their uh, torsional stress, 10 to 15%, and uh, 
yeah, uh, 75 to 80 percent is for the actual load, with the, which is a preload. And for the torsion free tightening method, you can uh, use the whole capability of the bolt for the preload, which means 80 to 90 percent of the yield strength. I've shown this on this slide where I compared the torque control and tightening methods of a um, hexagon nut with nominal size M52, uh, uh, strength class 8, and a Hycotec tension nut um, of the same diameter and strength class. Um, yeah, to, tightening, uh, to tighten a torsion uh, 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 hexagon nut M52, strength class 8, you have to apply a torque which is uh, approximately 8,600 newton meter. This is very high. So by hand, it's not possible. Uh, by hand, it's not possible. You have to um, to apply a hydraulic torque wrench or something else. The preload is uh, yeah, calculated for 90% utilization of the yield strength by the comparative stress of tensile stress and torsional stress, which is uh, 925 kilonewton. And the, as you have seen before, the tightening factor is 1.6 to 2.5 for torque control and tightening. In contrast to this, you need only 125 newton meters for each pressure bolt of the Hycotec tension nut, which is very easy to assemble with a standard torque wrench. And it's also very, very low compared to um, the, yeah, the required torque for the torque control tightening, which is over 8,000 Newton meters. Here you have a preload, which is approximately 80%. It's torsion free. So you, you have a higher um, a reserve at the end of 20% for external loads or something else. So the preload, uh, according to our data sheets, are for the Hycotec tension nut is 935 kilonewtons. And the tightening factor is only 1.1 to 1.3. This can be uh, shown in the uh, distortion triangle or the, um, the clamping diagram, where I've yeah, shown the, um, the difference. Again, the green line is, uh, represents the minimum um, preload you have uh, calculated with the main dimensioning formula. This was the uh, the sum within the brackets. And uh, then you have the maximum preload, which is, uh, yeah, which comes from the scattering of your um, tightening technique. The blue one, the blue tightening, uh, the blue clamping diagram shows um, the condition with the high contact tension nut. And the red diagram shows the condition with the uh, yeah, torque controlled tightening method. Yeah, the preload scattering for the Hycotec tension nut goes from 5% to plus minus 13%, and uh, with the torque control tightening, it's uh, 23% to 43%, which is a big deviation. So, what does it mean? So, it does mean that uh, you um, yeah, have only a minimum assembly preload. You can ensure with your tightening method for the torque control and tightening of four, 578 kilonewton. Because of the lower uh, tightening factor, the minimum assembly torque for the tension nut, because it's also more accurate, is uh, much higher, it's 850 kilonewtons. This means that you have the optimization, pot optimization potential. So you can apply smaller bolts. For the, torque uh, for the um, minimum preload, which results from the torque control tightening, which was 478 kilonewton, you can also apply a uh, tension nut with a smaller diameter, which is uh, only maybe M45. This could be sufficient in this case. This means you can uh, reduce the cost and also the weight of your construction. Yeah. So um, you have uh, maybe you have also lower material cost because uh, you can apply other materials which um, yeah 
due to the reduction of the maximum force. The second point is that um, also if you have the same diameter, higher loads can be transferred with the same diameter, which means a higher safety against maybe um, slipping in the interface, or which means you can uh, transfer higher transverse loads, transverse loads with uh, uh, your diameter and you have a higher safety with the same diameter. Yeah, um, potential processes to improve the friction or the surface quality in the interface may be not necessary because um, you, uh, as you've seen in the main dimensioning formula, we have this losses of preload due to embedding due to the surface roughness. When you apply a higher preload, you can live with those losses. And the third um, point is that um, hydraulic tools are not necessary, which also results maybe in lower cost, but definitely in simpler handling. Yeah, of course, um, as you have seen in the video, you have to tighten, to tighten a few of those pressure bolts, which is a little bit time consuming compared to um, the um, uh, assembly with an hydraulic torque wrench or something else. So there's an advantage when you have uh, yeah, a few of those tension nuts, big advantage because you have not those big tools, but maybe there is a little bit more time necessary when you have to assemble many of them. As you can see on this slide on the, on the left, so you can see um, application of our high contact tension nuts in assembly. Um, yeah, this is our, uh, many of those tension nuts. And each of those tension nuts has uh, yeah, up to 10 or more pressure bolts, which have to be tightened. And we have a specific assembly pattern, which means that uh, you have to, yeah, to tighten your yeah, first three bolts in a, a specified pattern, and then you have to go round and round, which means you have to apply this 125 Newton meters for several times, or maybe 40 times. For this case, we have our Hycotec tension tool, uh, multi tool you have seen uh, in the image before. You can also view the video on YouTube. But here I want to show you the um, time saving with this multi tool. So, blue line shows the manual um, uh, tightening of a Hycotec tension nut M20, uh, M52, and the green line shows uh, the tightening with the multi tool. So only one minute for the multi-tool and nearly three minutes for manual tightening, which is a uh, yeah, time saving of two minutes or nearly 70%. Okay, so this was the chapter um, preload generation tightening techniques. We come to the next chapter. The next chapter is we have dimensioned the preload, we have generated it. Now we have to remind this preload during operation. So preload retention means to prevent the boat from self-loosening. From self-loosening self -loosening means loss of preload. So self-loosening is a, is a generic term. So we have two phenomenons. On the one side, we have the loss of preload due to slackening, which can be caused by embedding or yeah, set settlement is another, another word for it, which um, defines the plastic flattening of surface roughness under compression. And uh, on the second hand, you have the creeping or relaxation of the material, which is time dependent as well as load and tip dependent, and it also is caused uh, by the temperature. On the second hand, you have the topic of self-rotation of both the joints. So it's a reduction um, due to or overcoming of self-retention. This can be happen under actual loads, but uh, more crucial than actual loads are transverse loads, which overcome the friction between the interfaces and can, can overcome the self-retention of the boat. So at first we have, so 
some Um, sorry, we have again a little bit technical okay. problems with the presentation. Now I can cannot see the, the slides anymore. So I'm online again. Okay, we stopped at uh, at uh, slide number 43. So here you can see uh, our um, test setup uh, from our laboratory where we did uh, a test on a ray connection bar with uh, insulating material. So this was a very so this was a, yeah very good test which shows uh, where we have where we um, tested the loss of preload due to yeah over a very long time. The test ran for in for to for in total three weeks. So what you see here, there's a ray connection bar between two ends of two rails, which are connected by this bar, and uh, between, between the rail and the connecting bar, there's a fiber reinforced plastic to insulate those connection bar. We applied two of the four bolts with strain gauges to measure the preload in the bolt. You see yeah, the schematic, yeah, the schematic picture um, on the right side on the lower right side is uh, um, the location of the bolts. Um, there is also a tightening pattern um, was specified. So at first, um, the bolt with the number one was assembled, and we um, applied the strain gauge into this bolt. Then the second bolt in the middle of the uh, connection uh, bar was assembled, and then the left and at least the um, the fourth bolt, the bolt number four, which is located on the right side, was assembled. So we um, applied the first um, tightened bolt and the last tightened bolt with strain gauges. And here you see the condition during tightening. And here you see that ejecting bolts affect the preloads of the previously tightened bolts. The red lines are the torque we applied to each bolt. We have two tightening steps. At first, we apply 50% of the torque, and the second step, we applied 100% of the torque. And you see the blue line. This is the, the, the resultant preload of bolt number one. Of course, it's, uh, it goes up when we tighten it the first time with 50% uh, with, uh, of the normal torque. But then it falls down when we tighten in the first ejecting bolts to it, it was bolt number two. And again, it is reduced when we tighten it to the uh, second uh, ejecting bolts on the left, which is bolt number three. Then we tighten bolt number four. This has no effect on the preload uh, of bolt number one because it's not uh, yeah, n very near to it. There's a bolt in between. Yeah, then we tighten it uh, with 100% of normal torque and the same occur it occurs, the same thing occurs. And then we have, uh, before we um, uh, observe the torque over, several, uh, over a certain time, um, the preload is falls down from the maximum of the first uh, tightened bolt, which is um, represented by the blue line, to 60% and 100% for the, for the uh, last tightened bolt because recording starts after all bolts were tightened. Yeah, then we observed or measured the preload over three weeks in total. And uh, due to embedding or creeping of the insulating material, um, uh, preload uh, of, the bo of bolt number four, the loss of preload was nearly 40%. And the remaining preload on bolt number one was only 40% because of the loss during assembly. So, 
this has to be considered. You see that most of the preload um, was gone within yeah, the first 48 hours, and then um, yeah, some uh, losses of preloads um, were measured during the, la the rest of the time. Yeah, and now 60% of the um, uh, assembly preload and 40% of the assembly preload on board number one have to fulfill the functionality. So this is an example for the loss of preload. So what can you do when you have such um, influences as a countermeasures uh, measures against lichening? You can reduce the contact pressure if you have yielding or creeping at the contact pressure, which means you can use, uh, yeah, flange bolts or nuts or wider washers. But uh, you have to be careful with wider washers because they have to be, uh, yeah, a, a specific thickness because when they are very flat and wide, um, you know that there is a specific uh, compression cone which uh, starts at the outer diameter of the bolt head, goes through the washers, and it means that the uh, limiting diameter of the compression cone comes out of the washer before the outer diameter of the washer. You can use higher strength materials with lim higher limiting contact pressures so they won't creep or yield. Avoid thick surface coatings or sealings or something else. As you've seen in our example before, there was a creeping material um, applied between those uh, connection rods and the rail. Um, you can design a bolt with high electri uh, elastic resilience. You have seen it on the uh, distortion triangle. Um, then the, la the, the, the characteristic curves are not so steep, which means that the loss of preload is lower. Yeah, or you can use high preloaded bolts with uh, high strengths. It's the same as I told you for the high contact tension nut. Higher preload means if it don't comes to excessive yielding, higher remaining preload. So, and here are two examples for those securing devices. So, at first, uh, the washer, on the one hand, which are standardized in several standards, maybe uh, the ISO. 7089 or ISO 7093. Yeah, please consider the thickness of the washer and also the hardness because uh, when you um, use a bolt, a high strength bolt, uh, which, uh, which is very high preloaded, also the washer can yield under this preload, which means that uh, yeah, for a strength class 8.8, .8, a washer with a hardness of 200 Vickers is sufficient. But uh, for strength class 10.9 or 12.9, you need to apply hardened washers, which have a hardness of 300 Vickers. Yeah, to reduce the, to increase the extra resilience, you can use conical spring washers. But uh, also spring washers have their limits, so you have to ensure that the spring force is adjusted to the preload. So the other phenomenon uh, regarding the loss of preload was self-rotation. Self-rotation, it's, uh, it's a very big topic, and it's still, uh, yeah, it's still part of um, actual yeah, investigations and uh, sciences. But you can explain it with a three-phase model. At first, the, the acting transverse load has to overcome the friction between the bolted parts. And when you remember um, the first sentence, you want to ensure with your preload that this doesn't happen. But in some cases, is it possible when the it is possible when the preload, uh, yeah, is reduced due to slackening, or when the um, external forces are higher than expected. So this means that uh, yeah, one connected part can slide uh, relative to the other connected part. Um, so that uh, the bolt is bended because uh, you have still the friction on the bolt head and the nut, and uh, the bolt follows this movement. You can see it in the line below where I uh, try to show you the sinusoidal movement of the um, preload, uh, of the transverse force, and the um, amplitude of the transverse displacement. Yeah, in phase number two, um, 
the, um, the trans displacement in the amplitude becomes so high that uh, the elastical bending of the bolt um, yeah, causes very high reset forces because the bolt is also um, yeah, some kind of a spring in transverse direction, which means you can push against it, but you have a, a reset force which wants the bolt to become into the zero position again. And when this reset force is so high, it's very high, um, the, um, the friction on the bolt head is also overcome. So it means that the bolt head and the bearing surface of the nut are nearly frictionless. They move, so the, the plates move under the bolt head or the nut. The limiting, um, the limiting um, transit displacement can be explained um, with um, yeah, a theoretical um, beam model, which was uh, presented by Blume in the um, late 60s, um, which is depending on the clamping lengths and the Young's models and also the area of moment of inertia. So you can calculate a limiting transit displacement. This could be a little bit conservative in some cases, but it is possible to design it. So in phase number three, you have uh, to overcome also the self-retention of the strat. The self-retention of the bolt as a self-retention of the strat is uh, based on the friction in the strat. And you know the strat is, uh, yeah, is nothing else than an inclined plane, a helical inclined plane. So under idle con uh, conditions, uh, self you have self-retention due to static friction, but uh, under alternating transfer displacements, um, slippage occurs in the strat so that uh, this friction can be overcome. And you can try it at home by yourself. Maybe when you have an inclined plane, you can uh, make it with a book or something else, put a box or um, something else on it, so, some kind of body, and you can move it forward and backwards. In static condition, those uh, box doesn't slide. But when you move it in transverse direction, the book or the inclined plane, it will move downwards. So there's a physical principle behind it. If a force in random direction overcomes the frictional force of a solid body with a mass M on a surface with friction, that body can be also displaced in any other direction by a force which is lower than the frictional force. So this means when we have a transverse force acting in the thread, the friction can be overcome due to the component which uh, wants to move the body downwards the inclined plane, and so the bolt turns loose. Oh, sorry. This can be tested in the junk vibration test, which is shown here. You see our lab um, test trick but uh, everything is shown in the next slide on the video.
So, hello again. I hope you enjoyed the video. So, we have seen some examples for ineffective locking devices. So, an example for the ineffective locking device was the spring washer. Um, there are several others, uh, like the wave spring washers and tap washers. All of them were withdrawn in uh, uh, 2003 by the Dean. So, this was based on a junk vibration test uh, because uh, they have no locking performance in those junker tests. You cannot download this, uh, you know, all of those standards are withdrawn, but you can still supply those locking devices, but uh, they are ineffective against uh, self loosening under vibration. On the other hand, you have uh, locking devices or securing devices which uh, were former known as locking device, but they also lose preload under vibration. You have seen it on the line with a nylon nut in the, in the video on the junker test. Those uh, uh, securing devices are called loss prevention devices because they preventing the bolt the joint from falling apart after most of the preload is gone. They cannot prevent self-rotation, but uh, maybe they um, yeah, can remain a low residual preload. Yeah, and on the third hand, on the second hand, the finally, there are some effective locking devices. So the Dean 22, uh, 25201, uh, it uh, defines wedge lock washers as effective, serrated flange nuts and bolts, as well as thread adhesive. So they are liquid adhesives, like shown on the picture, as well as micro-encapsulated adhesives which are previously coated on the boat. Yeah, on the one on the one hand there are the wedge lock washers and the flange nut. Those ones uh, they need to imprint into the mating surfaces, which means that the mating surface has to be the hardness of the mating surface has to be lower than the hardness of the locking device. Um, this is not necessary for um, yeah glued or bolted joints which are locked with thread adhesives, but in this case you have to consider the maximum application temperature. Most of the or the general maximum uh, temperature is approximately 170 degrees. Also you have to um, yeah, ensure that the uh, surrounding is clean and the part has to be cleaned before and no lubricants can be applied because all of them they uh, reduce the locking performance of those adhesives. Yeah, the main influence factors on uh, influence parameters on self loosening is the preload, the so transverse load, transverse displacement, clamp length, resilience, surface condition, and lubrication. All of them are defined in the DIN 25201 standard. Yeah. The last chapter now is the preload endurance. We have seen, we have designed the bolt, we have generated the preload, and uh, under operational stress, it, it didn't come loose because we have uh, applied lock and device. And now in the final steps, we have to ensure that the bolt is able to withstand those loads. This can be done with during dimensioning of the bolt um, in the calculation steps uh, from step number 7 to step number 12, according to the VDI 2230. This uh, considers the assembly stress, the working stress, as well as the um, slipping and uh, the minimum length of engagement, which can, yeah, which, when it's too low, it can cause thread stripping. And additional failures can come from corrosion, uh, hydrogen embrittlement, or sudden and stochastic loads which uh, cannot be considered during um, the calculation according to VDI 2230. Yeah, I want to show you a few examples from our laboratory testing about both failures. So the first is a failure due to overstressing the bolt. So we tightened the uh, stud M10 made of stainless steel until fracture. So you see it, we tightened it with um, approximately, yeah, 50 newton meters 
but it uh, starts yielding uh, beginning at approximately 30 newton meters and it uh, fractures finally at a very big torque angle. Then we have uh, failures due to thread stripping. On the bolt on the left, you can see that uh, yeah, the, the remaining strat uh, of the bolts, which are in the nut thread, because the um, bolt thread was stripped, and so the bolt fails. Then you see a picture from an assembly in the field where bolts were sheared because of high um, transverse loads. And uh, also it was also um, it caused transverse loads and the bolts were also banded. So you have finally the bolts crack it. And then bolts can fail to, due to um, yeah, alternating actual stresses. So we ran um, uh, actual load fatigue test according to Dean uh, 969. And we compared standard hexagon nuts with um, an assembly with our HICO reaction nuts. You see here the, the uh, fatigue curves in a diagram with uh, the stress amplitude, which is uh, logarithmic, and also the load cycle the logarithmic. So you have lines in this diagram. It's blue lines for the HICO tech reaction nuts and the red line for the hexagon nuts. At both times the same nuts were used and you see an increase of the fatigue life with the reaction nuts. This originates from the construction of those reaction nuts. Um, in a standard hexagon nut, you have an uneven load distribution. Um, yeah, nearly 40% of the preload are transferred by the first engaged thread. This means high stresses at the first engaged thread so that the, um, the bolt the start breaks at this location. You have seen it on the photo on the previously slide. The high contact reaction nuts, uh, it can, uh, it flexes inward at the top and outward at the bottom so that you have um, a more even load distribution because um, it comes a little bit out of contact as the first engaged strat. This means that the first engaged strat is relieved and you have a more even load distribution and of course, not so much load is transferred by the first engaged thread. In addition, by this um, oh, sorry. In addition, you have a, a resilience like for a spring washer, because it's also conical. The bearing surface is conical, and you have a flatter line in the um, in the uh, distortion triangle or the, the clamping diagram which means that the result in actual alternating force is lower, which also increases fatigue life. And finally, this is our daily business, destroying bolts. We uh, run junket test until final, yeah, until final fracture of the bolt, because on the one hand, the bolt is locked. You um, have a high remaining preload, but you can run the junket test for yeah, many load cycles. And finally, it also breaks because also alternating stresses uh, originated from the alternating bending cause a fatigue fracture in the boat. You can see it on the picture in the middle. In this case, uh, this is on not uh, yeah, considered in video 2230, but it can be um, yeah, ex experimental um, examined and uh, yeah. I also worked on a calculation design um, specification, which should be uh, um, yeah, connected to the Dean 225201 uh, in the next times. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for for your audience. Um, I'm uh, very sorry for. Uh, the technical problems and uh, I'm very thankful for your patience. Um, yeah, if you have any questions or something else, um, please uh, contact me or um, yeah, yeah, you can uh, write down your questions or questions afterwards. Or if you have any topics to discuss with me, um, you can find my contact data on the um, handouts you will receive. 
So thank you, and I give uh, the word to Murat. Uh, hi, Tobias. Thank you very much for your presentation. I'm so sorry. Uh, our apologies for the, all the technical issues, and thank you very much for your resilience carrying on presenting for us. We have received uh, some questions, obviously. I'm sure more will come in the meantime. Um, let's start with um, how do the torque requirements differ for rolled and cut threaded fasteners? Uh, I don't understand it correctly. Can you repeat it, please? Um, they are. How do the torque requirements differ for rolled and cut thread fasteners? Oh, this is a very interesting topic. So most of the um, yeah, it, uh, with uh, yeah, we have done not uh, so much uh, investigations in our in our lab, but uh, yes, there are some deviations because uh, yeah, roads uh, they are a little bit sharper to cut the threads. Um, I have not a specific value for it. I'm sorry, but uh, we can offer some testings if if you're interested in it. Okay, thank you very much. Um, um, the next question maybe we can answer is high cotec tension nuts directly replace the nuts. Um, so can you give an example, like say M24 fastener? Uh, what size of small screws you would have to tighten for a large M24 size bolt? Or large MT5, you have to, um, yeah, or smallest high-contact tension nut, it is uh, um, M20 in the moment. Yeah, 16 is possible. So the pressure bolts which are locating, located uh, um, in concentrical, yeah, concentrical to the main thread are M6. M6 is okay. M6. For, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, the next one is... How much preload is in small screws which apply the preload? Um, are they not able to loosen themselves? Uh, yeah, um, you know, on small screws, uh, only very low preloads are possible. But mm -hmm. uh, they, are, they have also um, the specific strength classes, and so they can be preloaded uh, compared to the diameter uh, very high. But of course, they are not sufficient in many in many assemblies, so that you need a higher bolt. But it's the same calculation procedure. So it means you um, you calculate the bolt with a small diameter, and you have your um, acting uh, transverse load, and then you have to yeah to calculate uh, the preload for this bolt. It depends on the um, acting transverse force, so that they won't come loose. Um, um yeah, do you specify that, yeah. the do you specify the tightening torques for those little screws on the on the large uh, tension nuts? Um, oh, do you mean on the tension nuts? Sorry, I don't mm -hmm. understand you. Yes, I we, think speci so, yeah. we, we specify those torques on the tension nut, but mm -hmm. um, you have to uh, consider that the tension nut is not a locking device. It mm -hmm. ensures a very low scattering of the resultant uh, preload, and also this tension nut can come loose under transverse loads. But we offer a locking mechanism mechanisms mm -hmm. for, for those tension nuts. But okay. um, they can come loose. But of course, they are highly preloaded and they have a high connection to this washer because the uh, um, contact pressure on this washer is very high with these pressure pins. Okay, okay. Um, there is another long question. Let me digest this one. Um, is that not going to be a major time factor? So I assume it takes long time to actually tension, tension all those little nuts. And um, would it be an expensive option? Um, also, due to the loss of the load on bolts when tightening a joint, having to retighten many small bolts rather than just retightening a standard nut. Um, can you comment on this? Uh, I I guess this uh, question is again uh, a question regarding the hypotec tension nuts, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. Yes. Okay. So yeah, it's uh, time consuming to, to tighten those uh, pressure pins uh, on one board. You have seen it on uh, the slide where I compared um, the uh, multi tool, which is a little bit faster, mm -hmm. or distinctly faster. Um, of course, the time. You have to consider the time, but um, the effort is uh, also very low. Um, you can tighten a bolt a little bit faster, but you have to use a, a torque wrench to tighten it. 
and uh, or a hydraulic tool to tighten very um, large bolts, which is also very time consuming to go from one bolt to another and also to arrange those tools. Yeah. And you have to calibrate it, you have to set up it. Um, yeah. And uh, it's more simpler with uh, yeah, a classic uh, torque wrench you use for Hycotech nuts. So for the benefit of accuracy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And the accuracy is higher. Yeah, exactly. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, the other one is, is there not a problem with water ingress in the studs between the washer and small bots and nut rises, as nut rises? Yeah, I think this yeah. may be... This may be the this may be the locking washer I think the wedge no, wedge washer I think is there not a problem in getting water ingress to the stud between the washer and small bolts or maybe the, maybe still the tension not actually sorry um, and the small bolts and rises yeah um, both the tension nut and the wedge lock washers are yeah of course water can cause corrosion this could be mm -hmm. an issue uh, both the tension nut and the wedge lock washer. Are, uh, can be ordered in a uh, coated condition. So we have a zinc flake coating on it uh, and also in stainless steel. But the zinc flake coating, it prevents the washer from corrosion. And it is also because um, it uh, offers um, it, yeah, it can also secure the surrounding parts from corrosion. Okay. But, uh, we d did several of those testings. This was done during research and development. You have seen we have an own salt spray test rig where we um, also test uh, tangent uh, bolted joints so that we can uh, give you a certain uh, time into the salt spray test for an assembly. Okay. Okay. Um, the time is going on really, so I will take the last question here. And if there is more questions, I think we will have to cover them later on. Yeah. Um, the they 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 are asking. Didn't you say earlier that the wedge lock needed 30, 40 percent more preload? Why wasn't this this done in the Yonker test? Um, so the wedge the wedge lock washer needs up to 35 percent more torque. I think what they're referring to is um, the torque value because yeah. that that test I believe is only showing the kilonewtons the preload on the bolt, not the tightening torque actually. Yeah, I think, I think yeah. yeah, yeah. So you have seen it. Uh, the, te the junker test is preload based. So every mm -hmm. every bolt you have, every test you have seen was done with the same preload, but the torque they uh, differ between the different locking devices. So yeah. this is the reason why you see on the last page also the functionality of the wedge lock washer be with only half of the preload, which means that the lower torque was applied. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think that clarifies um, all the questions we can answer so far. Uh, the rest of the questions, we, we have to send our apologies. And sorry about the time it, it's taken as well and all the technical problems. Um, as I'm a key Lankshirari, we would like to thank you all uh, for attending this and bearing with us. I'd like to thank uh, Tobias Hübing, um, as well as Paul Winzer. Um, and Andrew Pinkerton for introducing the session and Fiona Wong to facilitate this with us as well. So thank, I thank all of them and as well as you. Um, we have some upcoming events. Please check our websites. We will share the PDF slides. The recording will be tidied up and uploaded onto the website so you will be able to uh, download it in, in the end uh, or watch it later or share it with your friends and colleagues as well. So thank you again for your attention and have a great Christmas and a happy new year. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much.